Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to do something just a little bit different this morning. I'm only going to use uh, the message Bible today. I, I chose to just use a different translation today for, for a number of reasons. Maybe one of the biggest reasons is when you read the same Bible all of the time, they're going to be fine. Just watch me. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna exit easily. <clears throat> Whenever you use the same Bible all of the time, you get very familiar with it. Yes. And, you, and you get a, a preconceived idea of what that scripture says and what it means. And so once in a while, it's good to uh, dust another version off or buy another version. I really like the message. Is it the most accurate word for word? No, it's a translation. They're all translations. I hate to tell you, but the King James is a translation. They're all translations. But once in a while when you pick up a different translation and read it, it, it just puts a little bit different light, a little bit different spin, and it's not heresy if it reads a little different from your KJV or your NKJV or your uh, NLT or the NIV. You know, a lot of people call the very popular NIV, and a lot of pastors call that the nearly inspired version because it has so many flaws in it, uh, so it's said. But anyway, every translation you have is not perfect. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. I want to say a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. But I'm going to read out of the, out of the uh, message today just because I personally like it and I get a lot out of it. It has a lot of life. And it might help us to look at some scriptures just a little bit different than what we usually do. We're six messages in to a series I'm calling Let's All Agree. And this, this series has a definite thrust to it. And it is to help us to build a grace culture. And I'm getting a huge vision for this. Uh, I think this is something that's worldwide. Those of you that are watching on the stream, what I have to say today here at Grace Point applies to you wherever you live, as much as it does here in Houston, Texas. I think God is, is building a grace culture. Nobody has, that I know of has put a rope around this thing and said, okay, look, let's begin to talk about what a grace culture looks like. Let's begin to, to say this is what defines us as a grace culture. And once we nail the culture down, then we can become a community of people that begin to practice what the culture stands for. Every society has a culture. That's A culture are the norms that the majority of people say, this is important, this is what we believe, and this is, this is where we stand on this. So we've come through six messages. There are three things that we've really nailed down tight, I think, that I've said, let's all agree on these. And if we can agree on these three things so far in this series, I think we're somewhat on the way to building a grace culture that we as individuals... And as a church community, as not just local but worldwide, a church community worldwide can begin to practice in our daily lives. <clears throat> and that's really what this is all about, is becoming a grace community, not just within the four walls of a church, but becoming a grace community in the culture that we live, carrying it back into the office, into the school, into the workplace, wherever your world is, carrying that culture back and practicing it and living it in front of people. So let me just hit the three things that I've said, let's all agree to this. First of all, we all agreed on a definition of grace. And the definition that I put on grace, and it certainly is not the end-all, be-all definition, but I said to me, grace is the unconditional love of God through which He has embraced us and actually brought us into His very life. It is the unconditional love of God through which He has embraced us and brought us into His very life. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, and I know that by reading out of the message, I probably threw some of you a curveball, so we'll make sure we put the scriptures on the screen. If you got your phone, it's not a problem. But if you just brought your Bible, you, most of you probably didn't bring the message. But in Ephesians chapter 2 out of the message, it kind of lays this definition of, of grace out. I want to read verses uh, three, uh, verses 4, 5, and 6 out of the Message Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, It's a wonder God didn't lose His temper and do away with, with the whole of us, with a whole lot of us. Isn't that true? It's a wonder God didn't lose His temper and do away with a whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy... 
and with an incredible love, and the word love there is it's used in Ephesians 2, I think it's, it's in most all the versions, it is the word agape, I checked it out this week, so that is the unconditional love of God. So instead of losing his temper, he immersed us in mercy with a unconditional love of God, and he embraced us. So it just happens that there's two big parts of the definition of grace that I gave you. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, that God, in his unconditional love, he embraced us. And it goes on to say that he took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. So really there you've got the three full parts of the definition of grace that I gave you. You've got the unconditional love working. You've got the embrace of God. And you've got the impartation of life that he gave to us. And notice that it says he made us alive in Christ. Now this next sentence is really important. And I think a grace culture is going to have to embrace this at some point in time. He did all of this on his own with no help from us. Can I get an amen to that? Can we all agree that when God embraced us, when God, first of all, loved us unconditionally and embraced us and imparted to us His very life, it's something that He did all on His very own without any of our help, without any of our doing. It it says He did all this on His own with no help from us. And if that's not enough, then it goes on to say that He picked us up and set us down in the highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. So let me just say again, saying that grace is the unconditional love of God through which he's embraced us and brought us into his very life is not the end-all, be-all definition of grace. There are a lot of good definitions of grace. Very simple ones. Probably most of you have heard that grace is unmerited favor, and it is. That's, That's what unconditional love, it's unmerited. It's unmerited. The grace of God is unmerited favor. One of my favorite definitions of grace is it is a divine influence through which he has effected a change in us that has been effortless as we rest in him. Grace is uh, the work of God that as we rest in him, it is a divine influence that creates effortless change as we rest in him. And I have found that grace changes us effortlessly. It's not a work. It's not something you try to do to change yourself. Most of us, all of our Christian life, we've tried to change ourselves. We've tried to become something. We've tried to do. And the Christian life is not about the do. It's about what Jesus has done. Amen? So when we talk about a divine influence that has created effortless changes, we rest in Him. I think that's a great definition. But I also like the definition that it is the unconditional love of God through which He has embraced us and brought us into His very life. And whatever definition of grace that you want to embrace, the point is, in this culture... Everything flows from the favor of God. Listen to me. Everything flows from the favor of God apart from works righteousness. Works of righteousness. Now, a work of righteousness very simply is this, and you may want to write this down as a definition because you encounter works of righteousness almost everywhere you go in a Christian community. A work of righteousness is anything that you think you can do or must do to make yourself right with God. That is a work of righteousness. However finely you want to slice that, whenever it comes down, the bottom line is if you think that you need to do something, uh, that you need to say something, you need to pray something, something you feel that you must do to participate in making yourself right with God, absolutely totally conflicts with what we just read in Ephesians chapter 2, that it was His incredible love that He embraced us and took our sin dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did this all on His own with no help from us. So whatever definition of grace that you want to get, you need to know that a grace culture flows entirely out of the favor of God and it flows zero from a works righteousness position. So let's just agree on... The grace part of it. But then we begin to put down three pillars. The first pillar that we put down was in a grace culture is to say we need to have the right concept of God. And the right concept of God we agreed on was that the right concept made him a God that is relational and not judicial. God throughout the scripture has shown himself to be a relational God. From the, from the time Adam fell, God did not separate himself 
from Adam. He went looking for Adam. He was looking for relationship. It was Adam that became afraid and said, I need to go hide from God. I, I've messed up. God's going to be angry. God's going to be afraid. And what Adam did was he projected onto God his perception of God that God would be angry. God absolutely refused to take Adam's projection of anger and separation and instead kept the relational part of, the, of that dimension going and went looking for Adam. So above everything else, understand that God is relational this morning. God it basically is not judicial. He is relational in nature. He never yielded his relationship to mankind as being our individual father. He has never rescinded his image and likeness in every person. Every person born has the image and the likeness of God stamped indelibly on them. It might get covered over with uh, mess and, and garbage, but that image and likeness of God is there, and it's the job of the grace community to push all of that rubbish off the image and the likeness and begin to show man what his true identity is. Now, if, you're, if you've come through a lot of religion, you've probably been told that you were born separated from God, you were born without His image and likeness, you were born with no relationship. And that is not what Scripture teaches. You cannot find any place that God ever uh, walked away from His relationship with man. Man walked away from His relationship with God. Colossians says, because of evil works, we felt separated in our minds from God. It was only an illusional separation in the minds of man because of, like Adam, the wrong that we had done. But from God's perspective, he, he never left us. He's relational. Then the, the second uh, anchor or second pillar that we put down was to say, okay, then what is the character of this relational God? The next pillar needs to uncover the character of this relational God. We said that his basic character is love. Love plus nothing. We call it unconditional love. Bible calls it agape love. It means love plus nothing. A love that knows no limits. A love that is not restricted to any time frame. Even human life. It's not re restricted by conditions. Uh, it's a love that's not fair. It's a love that doesn't have to meet man's approval. And an absolute, it's a love that absolutely refuses, as I said just a minute ago, to take the projections of guilt and shame and separation that man feels in his heart sometimes because of the way that he's lived. And, and he's put, projected that and put that onto God and created a God of wrath, anger, and retribution. A God of anger, wrath, and retribution does not fit the model that Jesus came to reveal. Jesus said, I have come to show you the Father. At no point in time did Jesus show us a God of wrath, anger, or retribution. He showed us a God of acceptance, a God of love, a God of embrace. He showed us a God that, that put His arms around all of His creation and loves us and holds us tightly. Now I want to continue on with that this morning. I have volumes more I could say about those three. But if we can just come to an agreement we're on those three, on some kind of solid definition of grace, whether you like the one I gave you or you have your pet one, that's fine. This culture, this culture thrives on grace. It, it revolves around having a God that is relational. And a God that is not only relational, but a God that just oozes out of every pore a love that knows no limits, no time frame or conditions. It's not fair. It doesn't need our approval and it refuses all the projections of anger, hostility, and retribution that we try to project onto God to look back at us and punish us for the way that we have lived. Now, if, 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 if we can just grab those three, I, I know they're going to mess with some of your preconceived, built-in, humid, imparted knowledges, but the Holy Spirit is active today. I, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit, I am amazed at the job the Holy Spirit is doing today in uncovering truth to people layer after layer after layer in just the depths of those three that we've talked about so far. And I've got, uh, I've got five pillars all together, but these, these first three, I tell you, are, are flowing across the world like a tsunami. People are seeing the grace of God, the, re, the relational aspect of God, and this unconditional love of God in a way that I have never 
seen in all of my years of living as a Christian. Holy Spirit's doing His job. In fact, in John chapter 16, if you turn there with, with me to John chapter 16, you may want to just look up at, at the board on there. Jesus told us that this would happen. Jesus said in John chapter 16, I want to read verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. Jesus said this. He said, I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot handle them right now. Do you think that it's just possible that humanity has not been able to handle up to this time some of the things that Jesus would like to show us? And maybe 20 years from now, we will see more because we will be equipped to handle more in 20 years. Right? Jesus said, guys, there's a lot of things I want to tell you, but you can't handle them right now. The Holy Spirit will not reveal to you more than you're willing to handle. You're, some of you are sitting here this morning and you are in a rut. You, you're in the same spiritual, religious rut you have been since the day you got saved and the day you got indoctrinated into whatever persuasion you were indoctrinated in. And you haven't come any further because he can't show you anymore yet. He's breaking it down. He's breaking us down. He's bringing us to a place where we're receptive to what He will show us. Now let me just read on here a little bit. I have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. But when the friend comes, the Spirit of truth, He will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth there is. He won't draw attention to Himself. But he will make sense. I love this. I love this phrase. But he will make sense out of what is about to happen. Listen. And indeed out of all that I have done and said. The job of the Holy Spirit is to make sense to us out of everything that Jesus did and what he said. And what Jesus did and what he said, when the Holy Spirit shows you what he did and what he said... It might be different than what you thought he did and said 10 years ago. Are you open to that? If you're not open to that, then the first sentence I read, I have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. You can't handle them until you're willing to say, Holy Spirit, take me by the hand, lead me into all truth. If it conflicts with what I learned 10 years ago, so be it, weed it out, flush it out, I'm here to learn the absolute truth. I'm here to know exactly what you want to show me and teach me. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. That is His ministry. Jesus didn't say it was the job of the Bible. Now the Holy Spirit may use the Bible to do that. Or He may, when you're laying on your bed in the middle of the night, wake you up out of a sound sleep and just give you a download that blows your mind. Anybody ever had ever wake up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you start putting this together, that together with that one over here and this one, and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. And you say, when I get up in the morning, I, I, I got to get right there. And when you wake up in the morning, you totally forgot it. Yeah. I've gotten to where I, I try to keep a pad by my bed and there's sometimes I get stuff and I've learned. I'll run, in, run into my man cave where I've got some legal pads and I'll write it all down because... I'll tell you what, in the morning you forget it. But sometimes the Holy Spirit just downloads you, just gives you an understanding, a revelation, and, and no, you didn't read it out of here. You can't, you can't even maybe find something out of here that confirms it. It's, this, it's not the job of this to lead you into all truth. It's the job of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, He'll lead you into all truth. You need to develop a receptivity to what the Spirit of God is saying to you he will, he, Jesus said, he will speak of what I have given him and will show it to you. Let me read on. He will take you by the hand, guide you into all truth. He won't draw attention to himself, but will make sense out of what is about to happen and all, all of what I have done and said. He will honor me. He will take from me and deliver it to you. He will take from me and deliver it to you. He will go to Jesus and get what you need from him and come and give it to you. He won't draw attention to himself. He draws attention to Jesus. 
Everything the Father has is also mine. That is why I've said He takes from me and delivers to you. So whatever Jesus has has come from the Father. Holy Spirit goes to Jesus, takes what He has, which has come from the Father to, the, to Jesus, moves to the Spirit, and He comes and drops it in your heart. There's an order to that body of Christ. There's a divine order to that, from the Father to the Son to the Spirit to you. Amen? So let's leave our hearts open to that. Let's leave our hearts open. Now I want to finish up on this, on this third point or the second pillar, which is uh, God is love. Now these first three points, let me just say in passing, these first three points are to get your grace head screwed on right. This is to get your head screwed on right, to renew your mind, to unconform you, to religion and transform you according to the image and the likeness of the Father that you were created in. The, these three points get you beginning to think right. And if you think right, if you believe right, you'll act right. So these first three things get you believe, thinking right so that you can believe right and act right. Amen? Now once you have a firm Holy Spirit planted understanding of grace... And that the character of God is relational. Get, get the judicial God, the angry God of retribution. Get him out of your head. He'll, that, that thought plays, plays mind games with you. God is relational. He comes to get relationship with you. Once you get the relational God who only acts out of love, once you get yourself entrenched in that and you embrace it, we're going to find ourselves, now here's where I want to go this morning. We're going to find ourselves as a community wanting to touch the lives of other people with this pearl of great price that we've uncovered, that's always been there. It's been covered up. We're going to want to touch other people with this pearl of great price that has always been there, but it's been flowed over with rubbish and junk. So teaching the lives of others with what we have isn't going to be a drudgery. It's not going to be something we have to do. It'll be a natural response to the effortless change that you've encountered. I used to be so discouraged when we would want to go soul winning or witnessing or evangelizing. It was like pulling teeth to get people to go. To get people involved. You know, the best way was to make you feel guilty if you weren't doing it. But you know what? When you begin to embrace the grace of God and a God that is totally relational, who is filled with love, and He changes your life, it is a natural response that is effortless and fearless. You can't stop talking about it. It just comes out of you. It's not something you have to go do. It is what you are. Didn't Jesus say you shall be witnesses? He never said you shall do witnessing. He said you would be a witness. And I was, just, I was talking to Adrian just before service this morning. She was at a wedding. She has an aunt that is a Catholic nun. And she was... She talked to her aunt about what she's learning about the grace. And I said, well, what did, your, what did your aunt Catholic nun say? She said, she just smiled and was not in her head. <laughs> so she said, Adrian said, I was walking. I hope I'm not telling tales out of school. Is that right if I tell this? She said, so I started talking about some of the works that, the, that they do in the Catholic church, like, you know, the rosary bit and all the little stuff. And, and she said, you know, I'm just... I'm, and her, and, her, and her aunt that's a nun says, you know what? I've been questioning some of that myself. Now why is that? It's because the Holy Spirit is revealing to people today the fallacy of works righteousness, that man does something on his own to become right with God. God is showing himself today to be a father of all of us. And this fatherhood of God, once we grab that, once we get the honest truth of how big the fatherhood of God is, things begin to fall in place. So the greatest privilege that we have is to just live Christ to other people. That's what sonship is about. 
That's what, that's what it looks to walk as a son of God. It's to reflect his love. It's to reflect his life. It's not to go and beat somebody over the head. It's to let them know how much God cares for them, how much he loves them, how much he has embraced them, and how much he has secured their future for them. Amen. You see, the, the, the focus of the Christian world in 2015 is largely on how to live. How to live. A grace culture focuses on how to love as we've been loved. And there is a world of difference. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is about behavior. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about how to live. It's called the law. The law is about what to do, what not to do. The law is about what is good and what is evil. And 99% of the teaching that is done in the church today revolves around eating off of the wrong tree. I'm convinced of that. It's all involved about how to live. Staying away from evil and doing the good. In a grace culture, the focus is on to love as we've been loved. Do you see the difference? See, when, when, you, when you feed off of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and, you're, and the entire focus is on how to, how to live, when the entire focus is on what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil makes us very judgmental. The tree, because I, I look at you and you're not keeping, you're not doing what is right. You, you're doing what is wrong. It makes me judgment and it makes me very arrogant because I am doing what is right. I don't do wrong. I do the right. You're doing the wrong. It makes me very arrogant when I eat from that tree. It, it, it creates insiders and outsiders. You know, we're doing the right, we're in. You're doing the wrong, you're out. It produces fear, it produces death, it produces separation. The tree of life is a union with the giver of life and simply loving people like he does. The, Adam ate from the tree of life every evening when he went for a walk with God. The, the tree of life has its root in God who is the giver of all life and God is love. The, tr the root of the tree of life is love. It's not behavior. Now, all behavior is summed up in two things. All behavior is summed up in know the love that God has for you, no ifs, ands, or buts, and number two, to love others with that same love from the overflow that you've experienced. In fact, Jesus was an expert at taking people from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the tree of life. Can I just read you one, just read one passage of scripture? And I want, to see, I want you to see Jesus make this paradigm shift from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the tree of life. Let, I'm going to read it out, of course, out of the message this morning. Go, go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, and let me, just, let me just show this. Matthew chapter 22, and let me, let me pick it up in verse 35. Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. I want, you, I want you to see Jesus moving people from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the tree of life, right here. It says, one of the religious scholars spoke for them, posing a question they hoped would show Jesus up. Teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? God's law is a code of behavior. What is good? What is evil? What is right? What is wrong? So the question was, tell us what is the, the highest good and the lowest evil. We want to munch down on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Jesus. So tell us, what, what is the greatest law? Got it so far? All right. What, which is the most important? Now watch this. Jesus said, 
Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important and first on any list. But there is a second to set alongside. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commandments are pegs. Everything in God's law and prophet hangs on them. Now, do, do you see the subtle, do you see the subtle, do you see the shift Jesus made? They said, tell us what is good and what is evil. Tell us what is right and what is wrong. Jesus didn't give them what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, did he? He took them from that tree of behavior and he took them over to where the tree of life was, which is love. God is love. He is the source of all life. When you eat from the tree of life, you eat from God. And when you, when you nibble down on God, all you're going to get with every crunch is love. Right? So he takes them from the law, which is a code of behavior. A code of what is right, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. And he didn't give them any thou shalt or thou shalt not. Instead, he just moves them over to this other tree and hooks them up to love. God is love. He is the source of all life. So he moves them to this tree of life and he said, okay, here he said, just, just this too. He said, just love God and love other people with the same love with which you've been loved. And he said, those two things are pegs. And on those two pegs hangs all the law and all the prophets. In other words, if you do those two things, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil then becomes obsolete. It is no longer even in your life. It's no longer planted in your life. You're no longer drawing from it. When you eat from the tree of life, you can't eat from both trees at once. You either eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or you eat from the tree of life. You either eat from the tree of behavior, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil. You continue to eat from the tree that most churches feed you from, which is telling you what is right, what is wrong, based on their perception, based on their view, based on their interpretation. Or you go and you eat from the tree of life, which is the love of God, and you absorb the love of God, and you just love other people with that same love. Now, once you walk in that love, Jesus said, you don't have any, you don't have any cause or reason for being guided by what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, you'll automatically abide by it out of those two. Matter of fact, the Ten Commandments, the first five are relationship to God, the second five relationship to people. So God just took the first five, put it in one, took the second five, put it in one, got you off of the, got you off of the kick of trying to live a good, strong, I do, I don't do life to where you are now just connected to His love as the source of all that you have and all that you live. Folks, that is how a grace community rolls. We're not concerned as much about behavior as we are tapping into the right tree. Now, Jesus said that this mission that I have of getting you from one tree to the other tree is now your mission as well. He gave us that mission in John chapter 17. Come to the right, John chapter 17. This becomes now our mission. We, we, for the most part, I believe, and I got really excited this week when I started thinking about this, I think for the most part, we have missed our mission as the church. We have fed into this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've tried to teach people how to be good moral beings, and that was, never, that, that was not the mission of Jesus, nor is it our mission. I know that shocks you, but just hold on for all the message. Don't be sitting there devising arguments in your mind against me this morning. Just love me and flow with me. Just let the Holy Spirit talk. I, I, I look at some of your face sometimes and I know you just want to bust up. Well, what about this? What about that? How about here? And you're going to regurgitate 25 years of religious teaching to me and I've heard it all. I've been through it all. I even got the t-shirt and stayed the night. Got the whole deal. In John chapter 17, verse 18, Jesus said, In the same way, Father, you gave me a mission into the world, I give them a mission into the world. 
Same way you gave me a mission, I give them a mission. In the same way you sent me, I'm sending them. What, what was his mission and what is now our mission? All right, let's think about what, the, what was the mission of Jesus. Jesus basically had one mission. The Father sent the Son to unpack through parables, through teaching, through example of living, through attitudes... Jesus came to show us the Father so that we could see and experience the love from the Father to us that Jesus also experienced from the Father. He came to say, this is what the Father is really like. This is how the Father loves me. And this is how the Father wants to have relationship with you as well. Now we're going to read on and we're going to see that. But that... That was the mission while Jesus walked on earth. Yes, Jesus came to die on the cross and all of that. But while he walked on earth, he had a mission. And that was to totally unpack what the Father was like to everybody that he encountered. And he says, the mission that I have, I'm giving to you as well. Amen. You have a mission. It's not to wag your finger at people and tell them how sinful and wrong they are. They're going to hell and burn forever. Your mission is to show them how much the Father loves you and in fact loves them the same as He loves you. I don't care what they're doing or what they're involved in. He loves them as much as He loves you. And He loves Jesus the same that He loves you. So that means He loves Jesus the same as that culprit that you'd like to wag your finger at and tell them how sinful and wrong they are. And your mission is not to do that. Your mission is to unpack as Jesus unpacked through parables, through teaching, through messages, to show us what the Father was really like. So when, here, here's, what I, here's what happens. When someone sees and experiences the Father's love, it will in one second cause him to change way beyond a lifetime of what behavior modification can do. When somebody is touched with the love of God, it will change them in a second more than your badgering, your behavior preaching, your your don't do and your do, and your three steps to religious victory, spiritual victory, will ever accomplish. One touch of His love is transformational. Our job is to expose them to what the love of God really looks like. Now let's read on here. Let's come down to verse 21. Let's read a little bit more about this mission. Verse 21. The goal is for all of them. Everybody say, that includes us. Come on, everybody. That includes us. The goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So they might be one heart and mind with us. Uh, Do you see a culture beginning to arise here? Then the world might believe that in fact you sent me. Now he goes on to say, the same glory you gave me, I give them. When's the last time you got up in the morning and said, thank you that I have the same glory on my life that Jesus had on his? You ever looked in the mirror and said, you lucky dog, you got the glory of Jesus on you today. Isn't that just what he said? Same glory that you gave me, I give them. Do you appreciate having the glory of Jesus rest on you? You ever acknowledge that His glory rests on you? He said it does. So they'll all be unified and together. So they will all be unified and together. Everybody say that includes us. So they'll all be unified and together as we are. Now watch the intertwining here. I and them and you and me then they'll be mature in this oneness. I mean, do do you see a culture emerging there? One heart, one mind, one mission with each other and with the Father, through the Son, intertwined so that when the world looks at us, they essentially see Him. Amen? Amen? Now here's the result of that. Here's the result of it. Verse 23, verse 23 that they would give the godless world evidence that you sent me 
and loved them, which is the world, in the same way that you loved me. So when we come through verses 21 and 22, it gives the godless world evidence that you sent, that the Father sent Jesus and loved the world in the same way that the Father loved Jesus. Look, our world needs to hear how much they are loved. If you're going to preach an evangelistic message, it should be to tell the world, it should be to tell them that the love the Father has for them is identical to the love the Father has for Jesus. You interview 100 people at the mall today and ask them, who does the Father love more, me, you or Jesus? Does the Father love Jesus more or does He love you more? I guarantee you'll hardly get anybody say He loves us the same. Everybody say He loves Jesus more. That's not what the Father said. That's not what Jesus revealed. Our mission is the mission that Jesus had. The mission of Jesus was to let us know that we are loved with the same love that He loves Jesus. He then gives us that mission, verse 18, so that we go and our message is, the Father loves you with the same love that He loves Jesus. Now you know what? That's what a supernatural, unconditional, irrevocable, indiscriminate outpouring of love will do. Now if you go back to the start of the message this morning, and the three points that I said, let's nail this down, let's all agree, that we, that we have grace, that God is relational, and that God is love. Let's just nail those down. See, what grace will do, grace will show you that the level of love that you received from the Father. Now listen, listen to this. If, if, you're, if you're already at Luby's in line, stop it, listen. <laughs> Grace will show you that the level of love that you have received from the Father will be the level of love that you pass to others. The level of love that you have received from the Father will be the level that you have passed to others, especially those that don't deserve it. Amen. Especially to those that don't deserve it. See, there's a real sense that we become Jesus to those people we encounter. You know, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17? No, let me read it out of the message. Let me just tell you what it says out of the New King James. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is in, in this present world. Right. Now watch, watch this out of the message. See, in, in effect, you become Jesus to those you encounter. Now here's what it says out of the message translation. This way love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us, so that we're free of worry on Judgment Day. Check this out. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. When is the last time you heard that taught in church? That was the mission of Jesus to let you know that your standing with Him is identical to what the standing of Christ is. His, when His life is expressed as our life, the predominant picture that people will see will be Jesus, and you will love like Him. You'll love like Jesus. You'll love the down and outers like the Samaritan woman. You'll love the up and outers like, like Matthew the rich tax collector, or the unrighteous like Zacchaeus. You'll love the self-righteous. All oh, the self-righteous are the toughest to love, like Saul. You'll love the religious like Nicodemus. You'll, you'll love the immoral people like the woman at the well, or you'll love the highly moral like the rich young ruler. All Jesus did was love them all. It, it seems like this grace message, and I've had to resign myself to this because I've held out such hope for religious people. <laughs> but it seems like grace attracts those that religion rejects. I am a religion rejection. But that sounds like the ministry of Jesus, right? To attract those that religion rejects. That, that's, 
the ministry of a grace culture, we might as well set our minds to it, is that we will attract those that religion has rejected. That means a lot of hurt folks. They say, well, who, who are these people that religion rejects? Let, I, I read this. This really cracked me up. Look, look at this. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. You're going to love this. this. This is who you might as well get prepared. You're going to be dealing with a lot. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And uh, look, look at this. Let me read verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Verse 9 says, He told his next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at the common people. That's, that's church right there. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax man. The Pharisee posed. I mean, you know, you, you know there's right ways to pray, right? Yeah, you got to get it cranking. You got to get it moving. You got to get that baby working. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this. Now watch. Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Here's the rejects. Robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid like this tax man. I fast twice a week and tithe all of my money, right? Now, in modern Christian, in Christianity, the prayer would probably be, God, I thank you that I'm not like the liberals. I thank you that I'm not like the uh, unbiblical. I'm not like the homosexuals. I'm not like that obviously lost person over there. Those are the rejects. Those are the ones this message attracts. Now here's the deal. The problem Jesus faced, and if you're going to be a Jesus representing lover of rejects, you will face the same problem. It has, times have not changed. You'll face the same thing because religion, this message does not get, I don't know how to say it, does not get the religious seal of approval. Why does it not get the religious seal of approval? Because it does not fulfill religious expectations of who is worthy and who is not worthy. It doesn't fulfill the religious expectations of let's draw a line and you're in and you're out. See, when he stood and prayed, everybody he said, I thank you, I'm not like them. Those were outsiders. All of those like him are on the inside. So when we come along and say, every person is welcome to come into this church and join and be a member. I did a, I did a post, some of you saw it probably on Facebook yesterday, I just said, I got to publicly confess. And I did it in capital letters, and I know when a preacher puts, I got to publicly confess, I would get a lot of readers. <laughs> I said, I have to publicly confess, and I put it all in capital and I said, I have to confess that there is a church in Houston that everybody can come to, that everybody can join, everybody can be a part of. And I just, I went on for, and I, and I had more response and private messages and pastors, you know, pastors saying, you have guts, brother, to, to put something like that out there. I wish I could do, I wish I, I wish I could do that. And I just said, you know what, you got to do it because that's our, our, our market, our, all the, our market is those nobody else wants. All of us that have been hammered and beat up and rejected, you know, you've, you, you've, you've gone to prison, you've been divorced, you're, you were this and now you're... All of that stuff you've come through, you know, where, where some churches, you, you know, you, you couldn't be a deacon. You can tithe and they will take it, but you cannot be a deacon. You could not be ordained. You know, the Apostle Paul could not be ordained in most churches today. With his reputation, I'm sorry, he, he couldn't make it. See, Jesus got himself in trouble. And as a grace community, we will too for loving the wrong people. What, what religion says are the wrong people. And they will say things that will discredit your reputation. They will label you, call you things you're not, just so that it will detract from you. In fact... 
Come back three chapters to chapter 15 and here's what they said about Jesus and here's what they will say about this particular church here and you too if you become part of a grace culture. In Luke chapter 15 verse 1 it says, By this time a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus and notice they were listening intently. I'm telling you, this message draws the rejects. The only people that I see yawning and looking at their watch on Sunday morning are you religious people. All of the rejects are listening to me intently. They're listening intently, hanging on every word. All these people of doubtful reputation were listening intently. The Pharisees and religious scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled and said, He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. They grumbling triggered this story. As a grace community, I'm going to tell you, other people, pastors and churches, some of your family and friends, your neighbors, are going to say, oh, you go to that church that receives those people? Those people? We all know who those people are. Like somehow your love and friendship with those people is going to make you ungodly and unclean and you will become as unacceptable. I'm, I'm just preparing you for it. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. You will become as unacceptable as the unacceptable people that you accept. You will become despised by people that are close to you that are very religious. The pattern of Jesus was to love the immoral, the ignorant, the poor, the lepers, the rejects of the elitist Pharisee and Sadducees. Jesus hasn't changed his strategy through you, and honestly, you're not going to be able to help it. Terry quoted part of the scripture this morning, "...whereby are given unto you exceeding great and precious promises." And you can't help but minister to the rejects. Do you know why? The rest of that verse says, you have become a partaker of the divine nature. You have daddy's heart. You have daddy's heart in you. And that heart is a heart of, re of being relational and being totally love and acceptance. And as daddy's heart rises within you, and that heart of stone that you've had that said, you're in, you're out, you prayed, you didn't pray, you signed, you didn't sign, you're in, we can't receive you, you're out, you're not good enough, oh, you're okay, you're acceptable, we, oh, we see your life, you're oh, that's good, you're in. As that goes by the wayside, and daddy's heart becomes what it should be in your life, which is the main focus, and love touches and transforms you, the desire will be there. I'm telling you, the desire will be there, if it's not already, to just simply love other people. Now here's a radical idea. Let's all agree to this. Let's all agree. Let's all act like Jesus, even if the Pharisees don't like it. That is so radical. Because sometimes we just love and we wonder, you know, what are other people going to say? I've had people come to me and say, you know what, i got friends putting heat on me because of where I go to church. i got friends asking me stuff. You know what, okay, let them ask. Let, let's just love people indiscriminately. Let's love crackheads and corporate heads. Let's love ex-cons and felons. Let's, let's love deacons. How about, if, how about if we really love gay people and straight people? How about if we love immoral people and moral people? Poor people, rich people. How about if we just love them all? 
You know when this is going to be a real grace community, how you're going to know it's a grace community? When we come in on a Sunday morning and there is as many pimps sitting in the cheats as there are preachers. When we have as many pimps walk in here with a hat with a feather as we do people that have stood up behind a pulpit and preached a message before, then we're starting to be a grace community, right? It will be an evidence, a fruit of the love that is a Jesus-type acceptance. You know what I've discovered? Here's something I've discovered. Man, this has been so liberating. I've discovered that we've not been called to give an opinion on everything everybody does or doesn't do. That has been so liberating to me. I don't have to give an opinion on everything everybody does or doesn't do. Just love them. I don't have to condone or I don't have to condemn. I don't have to decide if they deserve it or don't deserve it. What do you think would happen to a church if they just loved people to the point that the Pharisees said, that is shameful? If we love that way, I think we're in good company. And you just might hear a little voice saying, I'm proud of you, you're just like me. I'm proud of you, you're just like me. You know, can we all agree? Can we all agree? This is how we will love and that's how we're going to win the world. That's what Jesus said in John 17, 23. When they see this community arising, one heart, one mind intertwined with us in love, in relationship, walking in grace like I walked in, the world will believe that the Father sent the Son. Listen, you need to pick this CD up this morning and listen to it a bunch of times until it gets down in your spirit and it is really you, until this Word becomes your flesh. And when it does, you know what? This, this is going to be unstoppable. This is going to wave across this city. You have not seen anything yet. I'm telling you, the time is now and the time is ripe. The fruit is in the field. We just need those to walk out in the field and expose who they are and what they are and love like Jesus loves. Amen.